Hey, it's Pat here. I'm going to go over my matches against Basta in the 2017 year-end top eight event. Uh, it's best of, best of five. So I believe we both kept sevens. Um, I have a turn one Aether Vial, which is the strongest play that the four-color pod deck has. Basta just plays Skull Clamp, so that's great for me. Nothing aggressive. So I crack Windswept Heath. Um, you always have to be conscious of what you're fetching with this deck because your pips are really important. Turn 2 Sylvan Ranger, continue to develop towards the late game, try not to miss land drops. Sylvan Ranger and Wood Elves really important parts of the deck. Your second green source now. So Basta ships back without making a second land drop. You got to be really wary here because his, he kept this hand, so it's there's got to be a lot of action in it, a reason to keep a one lander. But I'm going to punish him for keeping the one lander. So the tutors in this deck are always difficult. Uh, I like my choice here. A lot of choices in the future that I make with tutors I don't like so much, but this one's pretty obvious. You just blow up his one land and it's going to slow him down almost too much to be able to get back in the game. Uh, my hand wasn't too great at this point. But I do have a Planeswalker, so it's pretty good against one land. So now I get a second red source. You want to try to work to three on five mana in case you draw or have Kiki Jiki in your hand. I don't have it in my hand. My plan's to work up to finding it with Nahiri. So I tick it up and I want to find some powerful cards to continue to apply pressure against his one land in play. And to use the free mana from my Aether Vial that I haven't used yet. My plan in scenarios like this is usually just to beat down, um, not expose any of your combo pieces because he's so far behind. And he likely has some sort of exile effect path to exile or swords to plowshares in his hand because he was willing to keep a one lander. Potentially has an even more powerful card, which he does end up having, but I didn't get the read on something like a instant speed sweeper that he did have. But I'm willing to play a long game with him because I because of the one lander he kept. Or still try to grind him out. Uh, I have the choice here to kill the Sylvan Library and I opt not to. I believe my cards are much more powerful in this match so that's the line that I continue to take. Both options were good though. So I see a Imperial Recruiter or a Recruiter of the Guard on top with my Jade Light Ranger, and I choose to keep it because on the next turn I can to I can f take my Aether Vial up to five, and I can cast the uh, Recruiter of the Guard, finding Kiki Jiki, and that can clone the Recruiter of the Guard or the Goblin Settler. I have a lot of lines open up to me here, uh, but there's a winning line cloning Recruiter of the Guard, and also Nahiri's at 8, so I can tick Nahiri down to find any creature in my deck, and it gives it haste. So I'm really going to put the squeeze on Basta on my next turn, make him have 
a couple of removal spells, which I think that he has at least two that he can cast. And I played Caracas. A very powerful line coming up is that Caracas can bounce Kiki Jiki to my hand, so if I have Aether Vial on five, I can put the Kiki Jiki back into play using the Aether Vial. So I can play around a few removal spells here. The Aether Vial goes up. Basta has three lands now. So I'm willing to play around two removal spells and I put them to the test here on purpose. A uh, card that I often go find is Zealous Conscripts. When you really want to put the squeeze on your opponent to e either take a creature from them or take a land. And also Conscripts and Kiki Jiki makes infinite Zealous Conscripts. So yeah, I cast Recruiter of the Guard. It goes and finds any creature with toughness two or less, basically the whole deck. I find Kiki Jiki. And then I I can I leave it in my hand for now because I'm gonna try to put pressure on him, so I act use the Nahiri. I I think about this line for a bit because I can get any creature in my deck, but I choose to go get zealous conscripts and take a land from him to make him to force the action on him. So I'm thinking he definitely has Swords to Plowshares or Path to Exile as one of the cards in his hand and another removal spell. So I start the action by taking his Razor Verge Thicket because it produces white. He can fetch a Scrubland with the Delta to have white up again, but if but then he has to have three instant speed removal spells and it has to be likely Swords to Plowshares and Path to Exile, which which I'm still in a fine place if he has all three, but I only figured he, he'd he have two. The hard and fast rule I go by with this deck is I never take Aether Vial up to six. There's only one six drop, and it's Woodland Bellower. Uh, but if you have it in your hand, you'd think, oh, I, I should take my Vial up to six in case they have Counter Magic, or I can put the Woodland Bellower in at instant speed. But it's never worth it. So I target the Razor Ridge Thicket with the Zealous Conscripts. Boss is forced to act. If he doesn't have two removal spells, I can vile in Kiki Jiki and make infinite conscripts and kill him on my attack step. So he's thinking about how to order this. What spells he needs to what removal spells he needs to cast on which creatures. Because he knows about the Kiki Jiki. So since I think he has two removal spells, my plan is this whole game has been to win through combat, not through making, not through, and not through a combo. Um, it's just incidental that if he didn't have two removal spells that I would win through a combo. So this is all on the stack in response to the Zealous Conscripts targeting the Razor Verge Thicket. So he does have the swords here. He chooses to start with swords. Then I vial in the Kiki Jiki, copy the Conscripts. And I'm threatening to make infinite conscripts now, so he has to respond to this. This is a really rough situation for him. Normally, swords to plowshares on Kiki Jiki spells game over for me, but I have the Caracas, and he has to stop my conscripts because I'm just going to do lethal damage with a couple of three power creatures. It doesn't, I don't need an infinite combo here. So I get to aggressively throw my Kiki Jiki into play, which is something I normally don't do. 
So yeah, he only has two removal spells, which is great for me here. Both of them have to go on the conscripts. So I still have, I can leave my Kikijiki in play, and at any time I want, I can use my Caracas to put it back in my hand, and then I can Aether Violet into play. So a braid resolves. I end up getting his Razor Verge Thicket, but I don't care about getting the land. I just wanted to force the, force the uh, action, so I don't have anything to do with the mana. Uh, that was such a long turn that I forgot that I had just played the Imperial Recruiter, uh, but we figured that out pretty quickly. So here I have a huge amount of powerful plays available to me because I can bounce my Kiki Cheeky and then I can copy Recruiter in play, which fetches up almost the entire deck of creatures. But I, the most powerful play, de it depends on what Basta does on his turn, but my most powerful play, I believed, was to just leave the Kiki Jiki in play and have the threat of doing something powerful because I'm so far ahead, it, it puts the ball in his court. It makes it so he has to, again, have a couple of removal spells just to be in the game, let alone like being able to start committing to the board so that he can have a chance to to go beyond just stabilizing the threat of the threat of Caracas plus Aether Vial with my Kiki Jiki is too much for him to overcome. I be I believe that's why I left Kiki Jiki in play. So he he plays Vampire Lacerator. I continue the threat of bouncing my Kiki Jiki, putting it back into play and copying something. And I just use it to attack here. I think it was probably my strongest line to not put myself in any harm's way since I still don't exactly know what he has. Of course, I could copy my recruiter, like I said. But if he has two removal spells again, I could put myself in danger of losing this game that I basically felt was unlosable if I keep making him have to be the one to cast spells. So if he if he makes he could block my Kiki Jiki and kill it here, but he's just dead to lethal damage. I wouldn't even have to bounce it back to my hand and expose it to removal spells. So yeah, he, he just picks him up. He'd need three removal spells to get out of that situation again. <coughs> two to kill, two to kill the Kiki, and then another one to not take lethal damage. At least on his next turn. So yeah, that I was, I was a bread and butter pod game. Really, just. Use my tutor. He showed me how the game was going to go, so I got to use my tutors to play towards what was advantageous to me and how the direction of the game was going to go. It's obvious when your opponent doesn't play a second land how it's going to go, but that's that first game. So Pod's, Pod's pretty advantaged versus aggressive decks like this, like he's not playing. Blood Moon or Magus of the Moon because he's playing four color. Those cards are really good against Pod. And Pod has a lot of recursion, so burn spells and a, like a clock with cheap creatures. It's quite hard to get them to a low life total before the Pod to a low life total before you can stabilize. <coughs> Yeah, we're just talking about the game. Saying his hand was really good. He, 
I think he had a fire covenant in his hand the whole game, but I never presented an opportunity for him to to sweep my entire board because I continued to force the action on him instead of just taking my most powerful play each turn. So I'm, I'm all again to my first six here. He keeps seven. And we're both quite willing to mulligan away hands that are just average even if they have a r good ratio of lands and spells so him keeping seven I know it's it's probably quite strong or presents a decent clock so I shocked myself and I play death right I didn't have the fetch land in my hand and Basta very wisely throughout this game. You'll see he chooses to not play a fetch land, even though I believe he had one since the start. Uh, the mana from if he did play a fetch land would have broke this game wide open for me. So he has a Sylvan Library again, but this time if he wants if if he wants to, he can start paying life on it. I have turned to Sylvan Ranger. Same as the first game, starts lets me fix my mana and play a longer game. So here's my first mistake of this game. Attacking with the Deathrite Shaman, not understanding how the game is going to play out. And it does end up biting me in the ass. Uh, this was a huge mistake. I'm not... I'm, I should just be trying to stabilize immediately. He had a one drop and a... And a way to get card advantage in the Sylvan Library. I couldn't think of why I wouldn't want to attack, but I'm not going to be doing lethal through just normal combat damage this game, so I just shouldn't have attacked, and then I would have found out why I didn't want to attack anyways. With Pod, you always want to play around your opponent's game plan. You like try to figure out how they're going to go about winning the game, and then you want to counteract that as best as you possibly can. So I think about blocking just to reduce the damage from the Rabble Master as the game goes on, but I start to realize here as I'm touching my Sylvan Ranger that I am not going to win this game through normal means. I'm going to have to combo him. And I'm looking at my hand, and I had a, I had a slow way to get the Felidar Guardian plus Sahili Ray combo, but I have to keep the Sylvan Ranger around because I don't have white. I didn't have white mana or blue mana. Or I, I still had to go get blue mana. I already got white mana on the first time I cast it. So I have to avoid taking lethal damage, and I have to keep my Sylvan Ranger around, so... So my plan is to get Felidar Guardian with the Imperial Recruiter, but I have to keep my Sylvan Ranger around till my next turn to blink, to use the Felidar Guardian to blink the Sylvan Ranger to go get the blue in order to cast the Sahili Rave, because I can see that Boss is refusing to play a fetch land, so I can't use my Deathrite Shaman to make blue. So from here on turn three, I'm basically all in on this this plan to combo him. And if he has anything that kills Felidar Guardian, I'm straight dead. 
but I decided that risk was better than trying to grind back it trying to grind back when he has Sylvan Library a high life total and he's way ahead on board already. Bit of a risky line, but that's what a hand that I was dealt. Like, a, for example, with, if I wanted to try to grind back in this game, I could have maybe tutored up a Flame Tongue Cabu with my Imperial Recruiter, or, sorry, a, a Fire Imp, and that would kill the Rabble Master. I, don't, I didn't have double white, so I couldn't get Palace Jailer, but he has so many creatures and probably has removal spells because he kept seven cards that I would not be willing to, like, to get, let him have the Monarch back. So that would have been, a, that was off the plate. Um, so he has Falcon Wrath, Arist Falcon Wrath Aristocrat here. Uh, he's really applying an insane amount of pressure. Uh, so all I'm trying to do here is save the most amount of life and keep my Sylvan Ranger around. The blocks are fairly obvious. I want to keep my Death Rite around in case he plays a fetch on his next turn because I, I do need the mana. So I take seven here down, seven here, it puts me to six. I can't use my death right to gain life because I need to use all my mana every turn just to go for this combo with Sahili and Felidar Guardian. I figure I'm dead in the water in this game because of the Sylvan Library and the fact that he kept seven, but this is my only line, so I'm going for it anyways. There's the I I I blinked my Sylvan Ranger. There's the island that I need to use to cast Sahili. So I'm just holding my breath here, kind of watching as the as this his turn's progressing because if he ends up tapping out and I'm not dead, then I do I know I'm going to end up winning this game. And he has five damage. He only has five damage on board. If I make some blocks, uh, he plays and equips Jit. It taps all his mana, so I I get really excited here because Jit doesn't do anything in this particular scenario. Even though that's probably my the card that I lose to the most in Highlander when I'm playing Pod. So I make up the blocks that I have to to survive and to keep my Felidar Guardian alive. And then he, he gets countered on his jet, but that's that's not enough to kill my Felidar Guardian. So he, he I think you can he's sort of starting to realize that he might lose this game when it looks like I never really had a chance. Uh, I could still lose to a removal spell here, but I'm going for it no matter what because that was my entire plan since I played the Sylvan Ranger on turn two of this game. And that's it. A bit lucky to to, get, to snag this game from the jaws of defeat. Even through a huge mistake like attacking with my death right on my, my turn two. But one life is not zero, and I get out of that game 2-0, so I'm, I lo I, winning the game on the draw is, is huge for me, obviously. So I yeah I, normally I like to use my tutors to play around my opponent's game plan but there I had to use my tutors for my own game plan and it's because he immediately put me in a spot that I felt like I was never coming back from. So I was exposed to him having 
basically any removal spell. Even a burn-based removal spell would have would have got him there. But even though my Felidar Guardian's a one-four, he can kill the Sahili Ray before it gets blinked and and stop the combo. So yeah, I was really surprised that he didn't have it, especially on a, a keep of seven. But he had the Sylvan Library and he had an aggressive one drop, so I, it's a pretty easy keep still. Yeah, we're just discussing the game. Winning on one life is always exciting. So I, I'm, st I'm still not even sure if my choice of tutor was 100% correct because I could have got something to stop his his Goblin Rebel Master at the time, but now that then I ended up winning the game, so my aggressive choice it paid off. But that doesn't mean it was 100% correct. I do like the choice of tutor though in this scenario. You'll see in other matches I made choices I really didn't like, but it got there. So boss is thinking about his hand again. He's really looking for a hand that has a removal spell and an aggressive creature. Especially since the, the aggressive creature plus the Sylvan Library hand that he kept in the last game did not get him there. So we both ship back, both going to first six. I'm all again very aggressively with pot. If I if I have a, a hand that I don't like too much, even if it's a good ratio of lands and spells, I, I put it back generally. I also try to find hands that are good in specific matchups. So here I'd like to see a mana creature and then a creature that interacts with his creatures, Fire Imp, Flame Tongue Cabu, or Palace Jailer, or a Kitchen Finx. Or a hand with a tutor. The hands with the tutors are obviously the best because it's since it's a creature box toolbox deck, I'm playing such a wide array of creatures with ETB effects that it's it's much harder to have the specific ones that you want in each matchup in your hand. He ships his hand back immediately. I'm thinking about mine. Always contemplating how each card's going to play out based on what he might do to see if I want to keep it.
All right, we, we're both on six. I scry to the bottom. So no one drop from Basta. That's that's great for me to see. I do have an elf. I always try to mulligan to a hand with either an elf or aether vial, which counts. So he, I think he had, he drew the death right. He scried it on top, so he didn't want to fetch it away, and he didn't have a one a one drop anyways. He also has Lotus Cobra in his hand, so he's trying to jump the curve by leaving the one fetch line in play with the Lotus Cobra. Uh, this is pretty interesting, though, because I have scavenging use, so I can, if he tries to make mana with his death right, I can exile it with, in response so he doesn't get to get the mana. This forces the, so then if he wants to play his Lotus Cobra, he has to use his other fetch land. And then that stops him from jumping mana with the Lotus Cobra by using his fetch line to generate additional mana and, and other colors. So I believe it, I had Strip Mine in my hand and I had Garrick Relentless, so I have a lot of choices here on my next turn. He's trying to figure out how his turn will play out based on not being able to use his death right for mana. I don't believe he has the third land drop, so he has to fetch play Deathrite and pass, or fetch play Lotus Cobra and then pass. And I, I can take an aggressive line if he does that, where I, I exile one of his lands anyways. So then on my next turn, I can exile the other one, and he has no Deathrite fuel, and I don't have to leave up green for my scavenging use anymore. But if I, I only have one green up, so if I go for that line on his, on his end step. And he has a removal spell for my scavenging ooze. It it would punish me for being aggressive, and it would unlock his death right shaman on his next turn. I think I I I find it, it it's worth it because I I want to unlock my mana on my next turn. So I have Garrick Relentless in my hand, and I think a little bit too much about this, and I end up attacking with the Scavenging Ooze when it was a really bad attack. Um, I, I, I thought that he might trade his Lotus Cobra for my Scavenging Ooze because, because my Scavenging Ooze is stopping his death right from making mana, and then I'd be able to play the, the Garrick and kill his death right, putting me extremely far ahead. Uh, he knows I'm not playing any instant speed removal spells, so if he wanted to t the trade, he could have had it. Uh, he neglects two, which is the right play. So it opens up all of his potential to have mana on his next turn. But so now if I play my Garrick and kill either of his creatures with it, I would have lost my Garrick, so I just have to strip mine him and pass. The much better line would have been to leave the scavenging who's on defense and play the Garrick Relentless. Probably shooting the, the death right. And then it would force him to, or if he had a removal spell, he would use it on my scavenging ooze, and then he'd be able to attack my, my Garrick, but 
I'm not too worried about losing my scavenging. It was losing Garrick would have been would be really bad. So it, maybe my line was okay. He does draw a land though, so he gets to actually start casting some spells here with the Lotus Cobra. I left up mana for scavenging ooze though, so he, he can't use his death right to make mana. The smuggler's copter was a really good play. I don't have a lot of ways to block flyers in my deck. Uh, but I play Exarch, I untap my trop and I use the mana to exile one of his lands with my scavenging ooze. So my first few turns were just spent trying to cut him off mana. But now he has Smuggler's Copter, which can loot, so he's probably going to find lands. And since he played a Flyer, I wish that I played my Garrick the turn before. Because now it's going to come down and die to the Smuggler's Copter no matter what if I choose to cast it. So I, I, it, I have to tap out to play Garrick. So I can't leave up Scavenging Ooze. I choose to kill the Death Rite. But... It's hard to say which is more correct, killing the Death Rite or killing the Lotus Cobra. Because my Garrick's going to die to his Smuggler's Copter anyways, and both of them can crew the Copter. Um, he only has currently has one more Death Rite activation, so if he draws a land between his draw step and his Smuggler's Copter activation, he gets to go up to four mana, or five if it's a fetch land, so I think I should have killed the Lotus Cobra in hindsight. If if he gets me down to a low life total, though the the Lotus Cobra is not going to be able to attack through my my defense, but the Death Rite will be able to, would have been able to do damage. So the games usually go long, so that was a relevant thought that he might be able to use the Death Rite to kill me later on. He finds Mox instead of land which is much worse than a land because of his Lotus Cobra. Normally much better. So he kills my flipped Garrick with his Smuggler's Copter. Leaving me at a high life total, but not an insane board. If I got to untap with the scavenging ooze, I'm likely going to be far ahead because I, I can race out of the, big, the biggest creature on the board, but he kills it. So it's, it's not looking that great for me right now. I need a way to kill the Smuggler's Copter though, like a Reclamation Sage or a, cre a way to tutor Reclamation Sage. He finds a land and it puts him up to four mana with the Lotus Cobra trigger. So he's really starting to to rev the engines up here. And I didn't have a whole heck of a lot going on. Bloodbraid puts two three power creatures into play. 
Uh, it, attacking with my Deceiver Exarch was <laughs> another huge mistake. But he is, I'm at 20 and he's at 10, so it's less of a mistake than attacking with my Death right last turn. Because it does look like maybe I'm, I have a chance to win this game through normal combat. But the Exarch would have saved a lot of damage. I have Woodland Bell over here, though. This draw digs me right back into the game. So this is the I can I have a lot of options of what I can tutor here, and I I didn't make the right choice. I at the start of the match, well, I autopiloted a little bit at the start of the match. I chose that, or I thought that my deck has it has better draws and a better late game. So. I'm going to play with that in mind, and if I think that the board's fairly stable, I can start trying to find my more powerful cards. Uh, the best thing to get here would have been Rex Sage to kill his Smuggler's Copter, and then he has no good attacks, and he doesn't get to draw extra cards, or see extra cards at least. Uh, I, I choose to get Corsair to to try and get some card advantage because I am following suit in thinking that my cards are more powerful and I want to see more of mine. And Corsair gains life. But it, getting Rexage would have 100% been a more powerful play here to kill the Smuggler's Copter, stop him from seeing extra cards, and completely lock down the board. Like, I'm ahead on mana. I can draw with my Horizon Canopy if I wanted. And I, my last card was Sylvan Library anyway, so this that play was, that tutor was not my best option. So he crews up his copter. I'm at 11. He hits me to 8. Gets to see more cards. And I hadn't realized my mistake at this time. Still sitting there, quite happy to go to eight and then hopefully find the land next turn, go back up to nine with the Courser, and continue to think that my cards are strong enough that I can outdo his smuggler's copter. At least most of his ground force that he's playing out is easy for me to stop. Krakus gains me a life, but it's not doing anything in terms of affecting the board. Uh, the Settler is still fine here because he's low on lands. And he's playing four colors, so I can cut him off a color. I can cut him off white or red or black. I can use my so I can use my Horizon Canopy to draw my Settler if I want to cast it this turn. Uh, I have no good attacks though. I'm on full on defense here and working towards either getting him to no creatures in play so I can start attacking or going for a combo. So I think about it for a while. I have to count my mana because I have this Sylvan Library still in my hand. And I'm trying to figure out if I can cast Library plus draw with my Horizon Canopy and play the Settler, which I can't. So I just have to take another hit from his Smuggler's Copter that I, I could have killed last turn, and he gets to see more cards. He can only His only good attack is with the Smuggler's Copter, though, because of my ground force. He can't just swing with the team and get me close to, to dying. And the, sm the Smuggler's Copter hits in increments of three, so if my Corsair is going to be gaining life because I have Sylvan Library. I'm likely going to find a land on top, and that puts me above increments of three.
he he has Liliana the last hope in his hand. He's I think he's trying to decide if it's worth it to like maybe loot it away. Um, he'd have to play the swamp, and he can kill start killing my elves, but he still can't swing with his whole ground force if he kills my elves. So he decides to just attack with the coppler and loot first. I like this line. He's looking. He should just be looking for like burn spells or removal spells. Oh, he chooses to get back. All oh, right, he chooses to get back. Stone Forge with Liliana and cast it. So the game was looking really good, but. If he, now he's going to get jit. Suddenly I'm in, in a really rough spot. So I draw an end step with my horizon canopy. There's another there's a land on top, but I can put it I can put it a card or more down with the Sylvan Library, and then use my courser to draw it. So I find a tutor. Uh, this another tutor that I should be using to get Rex Sage to blow up the copter so he has no good attacks. But I didn't realize my mistake the first time I got, I had the opportunity to get Rex Sage so I don't realize it again. And I still follow the line of thinking that my cards are better, I should be trying to find my my more powerful cards. Um, but in this, I'm also, now I'm under the under the scare of him being able to attack with a jit on his next turn. So I I use my tutors a little bit more aggressively trying to find the cards in my deck that I want being a a combo because I have the XR can play. Kiki Jiki or a Splinter Twin or a creature tutor. So I, 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 I was I'm contemplating what to green Sun Zenith for here. And I end up choosing a new edition at the time, which I get bugged a lot for because it wasn't my best play. And I just had to double check that I can cast Settler plus Green Sun for three. It's funny that in hindsight it's so obvious that getting Rex Sage is the right play, play, but at the time I was thinking getting that getting Jade Light Ranger is better because it lets me see so many more cards on my next turn. But I wasn't that far out of this game, even even if he gets to play an attack with a jet on his turn. The knight was never really an option. I just grabbed it, grabbed it out to see, compare it to the other options I was thinking of. Yeah, so there's the, the Rex Sage. I didn't even really give it a huge second thought. I was thinking about it when I was sitting down, taking my time there on the decision, but I decided to play di to play differently. But uh, if I if I had got the Rex Sage, I would have got to see more cards basically because. He doesn't really have a great attack if I kill his smuggler's copter, so I get I probably get a whole extra turn in the game. Anyways, the J light goes off and I see two cards that I don't want, and on top is is the win next turn. Splinter twin on Deceiver X Arc. And it, it plays through a jet. I kill his red source to try to keep him off a way to 
a way to kill my deceiver exarch. It was a hard choice between that and the white source because white source could be path or swords which kill the the exarch. But if he it, he can use a red removal spell plus upping his Liliana to kill my exarch, so they both they both can kill deceiver exarch. Uh, like bolt or path can kill exarch here. So he's trying to figure out if all out attack kills me. Uh, he didn't draw a, a removal spell or a damage based red burn spell. He he wouldn't be considering this attack if I didn't show the splinter twin on top. So he's just lining up my best blocks. He didn't draw a land to play and equip Jid either here. So he he has to rely on on getting some damage through and drawing a burn spell with the smuggler's copter, but he doesn't have red mana either, so his draws are very limited here. The the settler was on my last turn was a like a very strong play in terms of keeping me alive in this game. So essentially the, the Jade Light Ranger drew me two cards, but if I had have got Rexage on and then instead and didn't draw those two cards, then on my turn the Sylvan Library would have found me the Splinter Twin because it was the third card down. Uh, I chose the more aggressive line because of the Jit. So I I was I all Jits is so good against Pod that I was really scared of giving him an extra turn. So say he found the fourth land, he would have got to attack with the Jit, and then on his next turn he would have got to attack with the Jit again, and that starts to put me in range of start like losing my whole board to his Jit. That's the reason I took the Jade Light line. Um, but it's hard to say which is better. I, the Rex Age would have been probably the stronger play. Rex Age on the Smuggler Sculptor, that is. So he lined up. He lined up my best blocks for me. He wasn't. He wasn't bluffing. Um, I guess that some respect, which was nice. I I lined up the blocks right after, and they're the ones that he set out. And it's it's not lethal. So he's just making sure he didn't miss anything here. Um, that's why all the thinking's involved. What to take the Liliana up on. <coughs> So yeah, he can tick up the Liliana, he can kill my Goblin Settler. I have four blockers. Um, he's going to hit me with the Smuggler's Copter no matter what. That puts me to four. And then I'm going to block everything but his, his least powerful attacker. But he leaves the Lotus Cobra back because he might need mana.
I think he, he doesn't do an all out swing. He doesn't tick up his Liliana because he's trying to find, he's trying to leave himself the most outs. And if he found a red removal spell, he would need to tick the Liliana up on the X arc. I um, might just make make the obvious blocks. And I'm not dead, so that's that. Um I he would he could have hit me to one in that game, so the early courser that gained me a few life and then 